Welcome to another episode of Bob Friday Talks. We've been talking a lot about AI for networking. I thought we'd switch it up today and talk a little bit about networking for AI. And for that, I invite a Sharda from Juniper's ASIC team to join us today. Sharda, welcome. Maybe you can give the audience a little bit of background on yourself. Yeah, sure, Bob. Uh, so I'm Sharda Yeluri, and I'm a Senior Director of Engineering in Silicon Group. I'm in charge of building Express Silicon that's used in PTX family of uh, routers and switches that uh, Juniper has been delivering. Uh, I have been in Juniper for almost like two decades and I'm oh. enjoying every single day of it. So. Well, welcome. So, so maybe we'll start with you know AI for networking, networking for AI, potato, mm -hmm. potato. Maybe we start with you know what, what is the different networking for AI? How's that relevant to what you're doing in ASICs now? Yeah. yeah, sure. It's a little bit confusing, but it's not that hard to understand. So AI for networking, uh, it um, talks about like you know managing the network using AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, these network devices they have become so complex these days. Like you know, root causing a problem, troubleshooting has become pretty complex. And uh, what NIST and Morvis have been doing in the uh, data centers, LAN and WAN, we want to move it to the data centers as well, and pretty much use AI to efficiently manage the network like troubleshoot, analyze the traffic patterns, as well as like, you know, even predict the future patterns. Whereas networking for AI is the opposite of it. It is like uh, using the network to run the AI applications more efficiently. So while AI for networking is managing the network using AI, networking for AI is actually like making the AI more efficient using a efficient, high bandwidth, highly scalable network solution. Okay, so, so this is what's bringing Marvis to life. You know, somewhere all this Marvis software is running somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe we'll go a little bit, because I know our audience, you know, we, we've all heard that NVIDIA is the third most valuable company in the world now, um, selling thousands of GPUs. You know, I kind of roughly understand that, hey, Marvis is running on a Google Azure AWS data center. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the difference now between, you know, these data centers where Marvis has been running for the last 10, 15 years and this new networking for AI data center. So the ones, the data centers that we all know, uh, we it's also we can call it like a front-end data center because they're fronting the users. Users can run applications on the servers in the data centers. And a lot of these data centers are connected through high bandwidth Ethernet switches, and Juniper has many of them. Whereas the one uh, that we are talking about, AI um, uh, workloads, that's a back-end data center. So that connects many of the GPUs, like the ones from NVIDIA or from AMD. You are connecting them together to run the AI workloads. And here you can either use Ethernet switches or infinite band switches. Okay. So that's the difference. So they are completely isolated. Uh, they don't like you know intersect with each other. So, so like when I started NIST, I mean, I built a whole bunch of software, built a whole new cloud architecture on top of AWS. You know, did AWS have a back end back then? You know, what's, maybe a little bit more detail of. I got this front end. I take it that's been there forever now. And mm -hmm. is this back end new, or has there always been a back end to these data centers? Yeah, there's always been a back end because this AI, artificial intelligence models, have been here for a while. And the models have been increasing in complexity, both in terms of like the size of the model and the training data sets. And they have been like, you know, you have to split these models across the many GPUs. The moment you have to split the model across many GPUs, you need a uh, interconnect. And then when you are connecting them all together, and that's where the backend data center is. But recently, with all this LLM stuff, like you know, all this generative AI stuff, the scale of this uh, data center has gone like you know thousands of times uh, from what we were used to before. So that's where all the new challenges are coming ah, in. Okay, so these data centers have always had GPU somewhere in the back closet. We just didn't realize it. And so, so maybe give the audience a little bit. You know, Nvidia shipping. You know millions of these GPUs, mm -hmm. what is causing all those GPUs usually now? What, what are they doing with these GPUs? So the GPUs are mainly used for uh, training in the backend data center, whereas the front-end GPUs can be used for inference. Uh, the difference between the training and inference is training, you are taking an AI model and you are running through like an iterations of training, so the model can do what you want it to do. Whereas the inference, then you are using the model and then you are like you know giving a new input like you know for example a prompt or anything like you know when you are inferencing when you are asking chat gpt something and then you get the results out of it so the inference ones are probably running most probably running on the front end side uh, and uh, that's where like you know um, uh, it's like you know user interfaces with them 
the back end ones mainly are used for the training workloads um, and uh, the way the training is done is because these models are really large you split them across many many gpus and then uh, you are running uh, parallel computations across all of them and uh, once um, all these computations are done then the gpus are exchanging the results and after that they start the recomputation again so that's where the ai workload is little bit unique in terms of compared to the front end workload because there is lot of compute and lot of exchange of like you know heavy um, uh, traffic that's going on with low entropy between the gpus okay so so if i got this right you know if i think about the front end of the data center you know, this is like x86 intel servers mm -hmm. right this mm -hmm. is if i think of it intel is the king of the front end Mm -hmm. And NVIDIA is the king of the back end. Is that the way yeah. to think about this? Yeah. So I got NVIDIA GPUs. You know, so if I think about your typical data center, you know, Ethernet has been the king of hooking up all these servers and everything. Mm -hmm. you now, what about this InfiniBand I hear about? You know, yeah, I sure. hear that when we get into these high performance GPUs, you know, we have this little InfiniBand versus Ethernet going on. So to answer the first question, yeah, NVIDIA GPUs are the most dominant ones that are used in all the backend data centers. Although AMD is also coming up with its own GPU, and there are some other companies that are also coming up with the GPUs. And these GPUs can be connected with either InfiniBand or Ethernet. And like so far, like you know, before this Ethernet everywhere thing, that momentum has started, um, they were mainly using the InfiniBand switches. And InfiniBand is something that was um, invented to replace PCIe uh, for um, high bandwidth and low latency communication uh, between the storage devices, servers, and embedded systems. And Mellanox, uh, which was the company that was um, a standalone company before NVIDIA bought it, uh, it actually like uh, took the InfiniBand to the next level by using it in its switches. And NVIDIA bought an Mellanox so it can build an end-to-end -end solution, like a HPC cluster or AI cluster with it. And uh, when it comes to this uh, data center grade switches for infinite band, that means the switches that have very high radits, like you know, very high throughput, um, NVIDIA is the only vendor. So there is a customer monopoly there, and then it's pretty hard to like control the prices. So, and uh, that's why recently, like you know, we are all trying to see how Ethernet can enter that market space. And, uh, and we are uh, getting like, you know, pretty successful in that market. It sounds like Juniper's team Ethernet, mm -hmm. you know, the front end of this data center is all Ethernet, mm -hmm. you know, Juniper space. Now on the back end, you know, sounds like we have NVIDIA team, uh, NVIDIA team InfiniBand and we have team Jupiter Ethernet, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a little bit about the gap, you know, when mm -hmm. someone's trying to make a decision between Ethernet and InfiniBand, yeah, is sure. it really a decision? Is the gap really that big in yeah. performance? Yeah, yeah, so the reason for Ethernet, maybe there are a couple of reasons. It's not only, yeah, this is not only Juniper, a lot of other companies are also like, you know, build, uh, the building Ethernet switches. So Ethernet switches, because it's everywhere, like, you know, everywhere, like, you know, from core, like, you know, uh, data centers and LAN, WAN, all of it, like, you know, Ethernet switches are there. There is uh, a rich vendor ecosystem, and that's kind of getting the prices down. And also, it's um, also encouraging a lot of innovation. So if you look at it, the highest performing Ethernet switch on the market today, it has at least two times the bandwidth than the InfiniBand switch. So that means you need like, you know, almost half the number of switches to build the same fabric. Uh, because your bandwidth is doubled, then you don't need that many switches. And uh, coming to these camps, like, you know, NVIDIA versus Ethernet, I wouldn't say NVIDIA is just the InfiniBand camp. They are also building Ethernet switches. And ironically, their Ethernet wow. switches have double the bandwidth than their InfiniBand switch, uh, whatever is latest in the market. Uh, so coming to building an Ethernet switch, um, I, I believe very strongly that Ethernet uh, has come a long way that, I mean, uh, we have enough hooks uh, in place to build like, you know, these large data centers with like, you know, thousands of GPUs using the Ethernet. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of interoperable standards, and mm -hmm. I think we've seen Ethernet adapt to a lot of different mm -hmm. use cases, so I will tell you my money's on Ethernet going mm -hmm. forward. You know, yeah. The other thing I've seen, you've written a lot of articles and a lot of blogs about you know, putting these big, large LLM on top of these GPU clusters, you know, and about energy and sustainability, mm -hmm. and making sure we're using these GPUs efficiently. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe a little bit of details. I'm trying to understand you know, what's going on with all this training. Uh, 
uh, I think I talked a little bit about the training before, right? So in terms of training, uh, like, you know, you first, like, you know, divide the uh, model into many, many GPUs, like, you know, depending upon the size of the uh, model. And then you go through this iteration of training. So in, uh, at the end of every iteration, these GPUs are all exchanging results. That's a very high bandwidth communication. Then the next iteration starts. Then they have to do the same compute communication, compute communication um, like steps. So the communication part of it like plays a very important role. So even though people can claim like you know your network speech is only like you know fifteen percent of the cost of the total data center because GPUs dominate the uh, cost of the data center, uh, the backend data center. If the network switch is not efficient and it's causing congestion, you're not going to use the GPUs efficiently. So even if you lose like 5% of um, efficiency in the GPU, you need 5% more GPUs to do the same training, right? So that's why the network um, the congestion, uh, that can happen a little bit more in Ethernet compared to InfiniBand like you know, how to control the congestion and how to utilize the links uh, between the GPUs so they are completely utilized are the challenging things uh, that come into the Ethernet uh, uh, switching, like you know, when you're building the data center switches with Ethernet. Yeah, you know, Sharda, you know, standards, interoperability, I am a big fan of standards interoperability. They almost always win. You know, maybe a little bit about what is Juniper doing around standards and interoperability for networking for AI in these GPU clusters that we're building? Sure, yeah, this is a good question, Bob. So if you look at like the, some of the things I talked about before, like, you know, we need to improve the link, link utilization, we need to control the congestion, so we are not increasing the job completion time of these workloads. Um, there are different techniques, uh, like, you know, for example, if you want to increase link utilization, you can spray the packets, but unless the NIC can reorder the packets, the spraying is not going to work. Similarly, congestion control, there are different mechanisms that each vendor is doing. So the solution space is a little bit scattered, it's not truly interoperable. Maybe at any point in time, you can see probably like two or three vendors that are doing the same thing, but not every vendor is doing the same thing, right? So that's where uh, this something called Ultra Ethernet Consortium uh, that was uh, uh, started and by hyperscalers and many switch vendors. And Juniper is a proud uh, member of that consortium. And the consortium is exactly trying to do this, coming up with a standard, like, you know, enhancing the Ethernet so it can handle this high bandwidth and uh, low latency communication and handle congestion properly and all the other things that it can do. And uh, the motto or whatever the main goal of the uh, consortium is to have a truly interoperable system. So and oh. there are many working groups and we are actively participating. And uh, one thing we do want to see is that like, you know, all the custom silicon that we are building, we want to make sure it complies to the new standards that are coming from the uh, UEC Consortium. Well, as I said, Sharda, my money's on Juniper and Ethernet, so thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us. Until next time, have a great weekend.